Breaking Cowboys news that could impact the game of the weekend. Rumors and reporting over reluctance resonates. And is it crash for Caleb or disastrous for Drake? We'll figure it out. We got all that and more. I'm Jason Fitz, and it is time for Inside Coverage. Welcome to Inside Coverage. By now, you know the group. We've got Yahoo Sports senior NFL reporters Charles Robinson, Jory Epstein. I'm Jason Fitz. Let's have a little bit of fun uh, throughout the course of the show. But we start, ladies and gentlemen, with huge breaking news. Got a couple of things to get to. We'll start with the very breaking news as we've just started taping this. Zach Wilson has been named officially the starter for the Jets over the course of this weekend, which sort of ends a weird week of reports and speculation about whether or not he wanted to start, what was going to go down. But we end up here. So, C-Rob, let's start with the very basic here. For Zach Wilson, we end up uh, in this spot. I'm not surprised by it. What do you make of it? (laughs) <laughs> I don't I don't know where else you would have turned at this point because you know you're not going to you're not going to win with Trevor Simeon as your as your quarterback your starting quarterback it's just not the talent level the difference between those two players is immense you know I I just don't I don't think there are any answers for the Jets now at this point I think they messed up the backup quarterback position and put themselves in a situation where as the offensive line deteriorated they they were going to lose no matter what they did. And uh, we've talked about how they didn't prepare for it. This is just the merry-go-round at this point. And I don't think it's going to change anything by the end of the season. Maybe the only upside here is that if Zach Wilson can somehow uh, re- repair the damage and, you know, through the rest of the season, maybe he can get another shot. I, I just can't imagine that they would once again roll the dice on him as a backup next year. I could be wrong about that, but a lot of that's going to have to do with how he plays uh, down the stretch. And I will say one thing out of all this stuff, all the messiness and the stuff that came out, and we're going to get into this. <laughs> when Aaron Rodgers says that he thinks the Jets should mount an investigation into the leaks, right? Somewhere, Brian Gutekunst, the general manager of the Green Bay Packers, is like, I really wish we could mount an investigation into all the leaks in our organization about me back when Aaron Rodgers was here. Because there was a lot of stuff getting out then, and I didn't hear Aaron Rodgers saying, there needs to be an investigation into how these leaks about Brian Gutekunst are getting out. Uh, By the way, quickly, Jory, I will say that's a fair point. And if the conversation is every locker room conversation should stay in the locker room, you could make the argument that Aaron Rodgers violated that very constitution by bringing any of this to the Pat McAfee show in general. Like, I mean, if the if the conversation is let's keep it all inside, you don't do that when you ask for, you know, a public investigation into leaks. Joy, your thoughts on all of this? Uh, yeah, first of all, I think that you make a really interesting point on like what should be sacred to the locker room, what should and, and also like in what types of environment should we talk about things? I mean, I want as much access as we can get as reporters, but when you have, I mean, when I was covering the Cowboys, Micah Parsons almost did this Bleacher Report show last year and he, in 2022, and he ended up not doing it being like, you know what? I think it's not what's in the best interest for, for the team. Now, 2023, he didn't. I think it's kind of interesting. Like Aaron Rodgers is farther along in his career. And so I think you get to this point where you can kind of do what you want. The more you have the credibility to do so, the more you understand the media landscape. I think that Rodgers is going to do it whether he wants to or not. But I do think that you have to understand that like you're essentially like sending messages to your locker room on a public platform at all points. Like you're not speaking to people other than the locker room. You might be able to tell your locker room additional context to this, but you are picking your messaging for a reason. He's very intentional about this. I mean, I think when it comes to Zach Wilson playing quarterback generally for the Jets, I think that whether they should be saying it out loud or not, and whether it's in the best interest of their long-term careers or even their medium and short-term careers to be saying it out loud, I think quarterbacks know they're just not currently in a good place if they're starting for the Jets. The offense is a mess. The offensive line, the way the quarterback is interacting with the rest of the offense, I think part of that is the talent at quarterback for everybody um, except for Aaron Rodgers. But I also think we've talked about on this podcast how Robert Sala has been like, well, in Zach Wilson's defense, this offense wasn't designed for him, which I think is really like a criticism, even if it's not how Sala intended it to be. It's a criticism of Nathaniel Hackett that this offense hasn't adjusted enough for anyone but Aaron Rodgers to succeed in it. And success doesn't have to be 40 points a game winning every game. It should be uh, scoring touchdowns in the, in the plural, most games. Like, I don't think that that is a crazy thing to expect from an NFL offense. Um, and the last thing I'll say on that is C Rob and I were having a conversation offline yesterday, just sort of like, what does this mean for guys like Robert Sala and Joe Douglas? And I think when it comes down to it, you cannot go into your 
season being like, we need to make sure everything is perfectly in place. If our starting quarterback, who we pay a ton of money to goes down, but you do need to have some plan for stopping the gap if that doesn't happen. And I think that Robert Sala and Joe Douglas have done a very good job on pretty much everything except for the backup quarterback plan, but that's a really big blemish in this season. And I think even if you're going up for Aaron Rodgers, like this is not that you tried something and it didn't work because you didn't know if it was going to work. You knew pretty well, in my opinion, that Zach Wilson was not ready. Now, I'm not saying he wasn't going to be ready in two or three years, but one year down the line, after everything that happened last year, both on and off the field with the Jets organization, it was going to be a bold move to rely on him this season. And so it's always interesting how general managers and coaches are constantly picking like which things are we really going to make sure we have good answers to and which ones are we going to kind of hope we don't have to have to deal with and the one that they hoped they didn't have to deal with really became a pretty big black eye on the organization this year i think what i just learned as you say you two talked offline about it is that there's a group that i'm not part of it's fine it's fine uh but i will say this like y'all i can't do this like, I, I think the most Im- you can't important thing. excluded from the group text. No, no that I can do. That's fine. Y'all, can, y- y'all be smart. But, you know, C Rob <laughs> just said merry go round. And you think about this. It, like, I feel like being that we're in the holidays right now, there's just this spot for a lot of people. Like, when you're about to go home for Thanksgiving or, you know, your Christmas or Hanukkah or your celebration, you just roll your eyes and you're like, great, gonna have to hear the same stories. We're gonna have to talk about the same things, gonna ha- have to eat the same. Like, I don't wanna do any of this, right? Like, that's how I feel about the Jets right now. Every single week, it's the same conversations. Guess what? The Jets screwed up their backup quarterback position. Guess what? Zach Wilson is not good enough to start. And guess what? The Jets are gonna look bad this week. Oh, and also, so guess what? Aaron Rodgers is going to talk about it. The thing that makes me frustrated is that we then have to react to every ounce of it when there's nothing new here. The Jets suck. That's the beginning of the story, the middle of the story, and the end of the story. Like, this is just, they screwed this up, to your point, C-Rob, coming into the season. Now they can't get it right. And all we can do is merciless. We just got to wait for this season to die at this point. That's all we can do with the Jets. We should just make a pact right now, unless something changes. <laughs> like, really significantly changes. We just stop talking about the Jets because the amount of energy we have expended on them up until this point for a bad team uh, is just it's it's foolish. And I don't want to keep going back and forth about it. With Aaron Rodgers in the picture, I'm not sure it's foolish. I think it, part of our job is to monitor the trends of the when league. Rogers and was as in the annoying picture. as it is, like I, again, I was telling this to Rob yesterday. Rodgers got on an, on Pat McAfee show last week and talked about Dak and his cadence and the way he was like playing at the line of scrimmage and actually quarterbacking, not just throwing. And I'm like, I wish that what he said wasn't as interesting to me as it was, but it is. And I don't think that everything off field, like, look, I don't want to get into all of Aaron Rodgers' science and ayahuasca at length on this podcast, but I think the football really to stuff he talks about like I, I think it'd be foolish if we didn't talk about it that's not what we're talking about though we're talking about <laughs> that he's saying about the organization and leaks and you fair, know fair. that that's repetitive he's talking yeah. about Z- what zach zach this zach that that's repetitive he's talking about you know the call the same it's just all the stuff about the jets that he says i mean We've already heard it up until this point. This is the beast, like, while we're just having a brutally honest moment, like, this is the beast of what we do, right? Like, I, So my longtime friend, Mike Dolan Jr., one day, we were on radio together at the time, and he made a joke. We didn't, like, he was screwed up the tease, what they say in the business, like trying to get everybody to listen to the next segment. Screwed up the tease, and he's like, coming up, LeBron versus Michael Jordan, who's the real GOAT? Call in. He did it as a joke. For the next two hours, the phone lines were full. And we sat there as a group laughing at the fact that, man, are we really going to talk about LeBron versus MJ again? But like you say that and people flock to it. The problem here, and it's just not not even the problem, but the reality of it is part of our job is to talk about the stories that resonate to fans. And But this is just maddening to me this year. Like I, I am so, my, my tank is full of just the around everything around the Jets. There's just, C-Rob says it every week. I'm starting to, Jory, Jory's usually the beacon of light. I'm usually sitting here like a Muppet in between and C-Rob's over there saying, oh, like I, I'm going to C-Rob's side. I've now hit the dark side of the force, Jory. I'm done. I'm, uh, I'm Darth Vader at this point of there's no Luke Skywalker left in me. You don't understand that reference because you've never seen the movies. We're off the rails. <laughs> you Wait, up C-Rob, what was dark side. Sierra, you need to run by Fitz, the reference that you gave me in the Eagles game over the weekend. Is it something Sopranos? Oh, yeah. I said the I said the the security guy looked like he was from like central casting, soprano central casting. And then I was like, I know you have no clue what that means. So, so I told him to, to bring re bring it up on the podcast that someone could appreciate what I'm sure is a great reference that I can't. 
Uh, that is a great reference. And let's bring that back when we talk about the Eagles, because I have so many questions about uh, Dom there. Real quick, uh, one more, because why not? Aaron Rodgers reportedly unlikely to return this season. Shocking, I know. But, I mean, does that change the way we Can look we at any? Can we do like a synchronized eye roll for this one? Yeah, yeah. You count us in, Joy. You count us in. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> I think Fellas. I went early. I think that was pretty good, though. They can, they can mash that. Up. Like, Is there anything to – this is what we expected, but is there any sort of deep dive jury in your mind on this? On him not playing? I mean, he never should have played this season. I think that he had couched it like, oh, if the doctors clear me, then I'll do it. And I also think that there was the doctors and there was the organization. And I think that to say that he was coming back to practice like made it feel like this could be something real. But coming back to practice in a non-contact situation to like – gingerly step back a few steps and then throw a ball with your upper body where you didn't have the injury is so different than getting behind that offensive line against the like live speed of 300 pound defensive tackles and defensive ends rushing at you in the game. So he made things interesting, I guess, but he should not come back this season. And I think that some of the biggest BS that he was giving us was, well, if I re-injure it, I'll have four to six months to, to recover again. Like that's not how re-injuries works. And I say this as a huge hypocrite because I'm really bad at actually resting my injuries. But as someone who's really bad at resting my injuries, I am well aware of how they then linger afterwards. And it's not just that like the timeline starts over after you stop. See, Rob, would you like to have the last chance for the entire season to say anything about Aaron Rodgers and the Jets? We sort of promise. No. <laughs> <laughs> and we're off. That's what makes this show so unique. I love that about you, brother. All right, uh, let's get to some other news and notes that are out there that do impact the rest of the league. Trevor Lawrence, high ankle sprain, uh, uphill battle is the quote to play on Sunday. But let's be real here. The AFC has turned into just a, a, a mass chaos yeah. move for the number one overall seed. See, Rob, this feels huge. Yeah, it's uh, it was funny because I was talking to somebody last night. It was a scout, and he he just couldn't believe how chaotic the the AFC looks right now. Like he's like, it's what he was saying to me last night. He's like, there's no um, guarantee that the Chiefs aren't in a fade that we don't see the Chiefs like fall off and you know don't host a home game and then they're losing in the first round of the playoffs. There's no. Uh, guarantee that the Broncos can't continue to, you know, piece things together and get themselves uh, a wild card spot. Like it's just the wild card. I don't even know where to begin. It's it's a complete, utter cluster right now of teams, and I think it's emblematic of this entire season. Early on, it felt like, hey, there's no real favorites. A lot of these teams feel like they kind of seem close to each other, and then you know the Chiefs kind of surface, and you're like, okay. Does this feel like it's getting back to how it usually does? The dominant teams that we expect are going to be there. Of course, everyone's going to talk about San Francisco. But I would say other than San Francisco, who, by the way, had a losing streak in the middle of the season after a couple of injuries, which shows some vulnerability. Um, it's going to be a wide open field, I think, for the Super Bowl this year. I, I wouldn't be surprised if when all the seeding settles out and we look at, say, the top four seeds in the AFC and NFC, I wouldn't be surprised if we look at any of those teams and go, yeah, it's really realistic that that number four seed could win the Super Bowl this year. Well, and I like what you said at the beginning about the Chiefs, because I think we kind of just expect them to be otherworldly because Patrick Mahomes is otherworldly while not realizing that, like, yes, he has compensated for a lack of receiver talent, among other things, in a lot of his seasons, but at some point, or offensive line until the Super Bowl the year that they lost to Brady and the Bucks. But I think there is a limit to that. And I think uh, one of the stats that Peter King had in his column last week, and I just pulled up her football reference to confirm it, though I figured Peter, as usual, was accurate, is that the Chiefs have played 16 playoff games since their last road playoff game, which is just crazy. And it hasn't been that long since the road playoff game. It was 2015 in Houston. But when you think about all of the home games, they, I mean, they've just run through uh, Arrowhead through the conference championship. And then of course the Super Bowl is at a neutral site. And it really is something that like when you have that sustained level of dominance and postseason dominance for so many years, you just start to assume like they're going to be in it. It's more like, it almost felt like the question wasn't, are they going to make the playoffs? It was, are they going to win the conference championship? Like it almost felt like this guarantee that Mahomes was going to at least get them to the conference championship. The question is, would they win that and or the Super Bowl? And so I guess, 
and the Super Bowl because there's no or you can't win the Super Bowl without winning the conference championship. But I think you're right. And I think that that is something that I also just like marvel at the AFC. And again, I know a lot of this is because of the quarterback injuries, but we thought this was such a stacked division. And now the AFC East, for example, like we thought that that was going to be such a competitive division because they had three like super teams and then Bill Belichick. And now it's like, okay, is Sean McDermott going to keep his job? I think Robert Saul is going to keep his job, but I would say it's like a 90 or 80% chance, not a hundred percent. And then Bill Belichick almost certainly is not going to keep his job. And so to have like a division like that in a conference where we thought it was going to be hybrid, go from four contenders to three of them might not even, or might not make the playoffs and might lose their coaches. Like there's just such a shakeup. And I think that's in so many ways, minus the injuries, why the NFL is so fun. Cause you just, you really can't predict it. I'd also add that not all home fields are created equal, right? Not all home field advantages look the same. And to your point that Mahomes has never in his career played a true road playoff game. So when you think about what that means for them, I mean, look, it's not that Jacksonville getting home field advantage means that, oh, my God, we have to go through the gauntlet known as Jacksonville. No disrespect to Jags fans, but it's less about that. And it's more about the Jags realizing they wouldn't have to go to Arrowhead. That's the big advantage. Much like in the NFC, I think the, the big advantage for Philly is you got to go to Philly. Like it's it's just that's tougher for a lot of teams to do. So I, I think when you look at where Jacksonville is right now and what they're trying to take advantage of, part of this is playing hot potato, playing keep away from Arrowhead specifically, because I'm not sure. Uh, no, again, I'm not discrediting Baltimore, places like that, but it just hits a little different than Arrowhead does, and it hits a little different for them. So I, I don't know that I necessarily buy a free fall concept for the Chiefs, but see, Rob, I do buy that the Chiefs at Arrowhead is going to be a much more difficult playoff matchup than the Chiefs would be coming somewhere else. There are a handful of places in the NFL, you know, maybe five, six, seven places where you're like, that place is just different. You know, that truly is Seattle. When Seattle's got it going, you go in that stadium and it's it's I've been down on the field when we used to be on the sidelines in late and four, you know, fourth quarter of games and couldn't hear the person standing next to me speaking arrowhead. The same deal, especially if it's, you know, weather, if it gets cold. I mean, it's in January's if it's a if it's going to be a snow filled stadium, a cold stadium, Lambeau when it gets cold as hell. It, it's just a completely different scenario. So um, as you said, I mean, sometimes. The seating isn't so much about getting people to your place. It's just making sure you don't go to theirs. <laughs> right. Also, and, like the Lambeau Field, <laughs> that might be a disadvantage for every team combined. But as we've discussed, there's some questions about that field. Oh, yeah, the grass, right. Yeah, the yeah, grass yeah. on the field. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's getting around. Like you, uh, People are talking about the grass on that field and, and how remarkable it is that all these injuries seem to be happening there and it's not field turf. It's actual field. It's it's real grass. And yet it's problematic. So I would say that. Especially in this season with this chief's unit, with what feels like some shortcomings at wide out, it's a really important year for the Chiefs to get that one seed more more than usual, I think. Yeah, I, I, that makes a lot of sense, especially considering the game of inches that the Chiefs season has been in their losses. It feels like they've all been super close. Keep those away from Arrowhead. and that that's. But also, there's a part of the Jags conversation that plays into another conversation we're having right now, because it wasn't that long ago that the Jags, you know, were bound for London and nobody cared at all of these things. It looked like a more bound franchise. And then they go out there and get Trevor Lawrence, and this speaks to why teams want that quarterback, because, you know, frankly, Trevor Lawrence has changed the way the entire organization is perceived, which brings us to Caleb Williams and Drake May because, you know, you guys know I'm a draft fanatic. I love it. I've covered it for years. It's my favorite sporting event of the entire season. So, like, I, I'm all in on this. But the Caleb Williams-Drake May thing is interesting to me, see, Robin. I know you're writing on this right now, but, you know, frankly, it wasn't that long ago that Caleb Williams was supposed to be so good that he was going to force teams not to draft him. And now I'm hearing multiple smart people tell me Drake May might go first. So what are you hearing on the quarterback situation that we're all obsessing about if our teams suck? Yeah, I don't think it's the automatic hammer lock that it felt like before the season. And there's going to be a wide range of reasoning that you hear, and it'll be interesting how much of it is spoken publicly. Really, let's put it in two categories. There's the on-field football, and then there's the off-field character eval, right? On-field football, what you're hearing more about Caleb Williams now that is concerning teams is – how much he is operating in sort of 
an unscripted manner on offense. He's running around. His feet aren't always set the way that they should be. There's a Manziel, there's a Johnny Manziel-esque quality to it when he was at A&M, where Johnny, a lot of the time, it looked like the offense was just Johnny trying to make a play, make something big happen. I think teams are starting to see some of that with Caleb Williams, especially in this last season, and they're going to nitpick at that. They're going to say, we need you to, that's great that you can make plays. That's awesome. We love that quality. But we also need to know that you can sit inside a structured offense and go through your reads and just just be play quarterback, right? Play quarterback. Don't play playmaker. And and then with Drake May, I think it's it's the opposite. Like he he can do that and he has shown the ability to do that and do the off script stuff, but he very much is playing traditional quarterback. And so the the playing styles, that's something though that a lot of people will talk about. And there are going to be people in the Caleb camp that say, hey, people are nitpicking this guy. He's an all-world talent. He's got an all-world arm. There's all these different things. There are going to be people in Drake May's camp that are going to say he's Andrew Luck. Like that's who they're going to point to. Like some people, the, the Caleb. Uh, people are going to point to Patrick Mahomes and say, this is Patrick Mahomes. And the Drake May people are going to point to Andrew Luck and, and say, that's Andrew Luck. And then you're going to get to the character eval. And this is where this is going to get interesting because I, I'm curious how much of it comes out. And I'm curious how much it feels like it starts to cook up like a Magic Johnson, LA, Flash, all this stuff versus Larry Bird, Gritty, you know, which is, that's a lot of dog whistle right? That, that happens in these evals. It starts to feel like, Hey, is this starting to be racial? Like, is there, why does this feel like, Oh, there's this set of words that we use for black athletes and a set of words that we use for white athletes. And why are we and Lamar Jackson should be a running back. And, and yeah, all right. And so then, you know, I think there's going to be questions about like all the NIL stuff and, and how has Caleb used it? Where's he living? Is he living in the Ritz Carlton? How many sports cars does he own at this point? Where's Drake May living? What is he? Dr- I know it's weird to say that, but I'm telling you, it's going to get into this eval and they're going to talk about painted nails, the crying with his mom, the I just want to curl up with my dog. Like, like, I hate to say it, but we would be lying if we approach this and go, yeah, general managers don't think about stuff like that. Coaches don't think about stuff like that. They do. It, as it heats up going toward the draft, it's going to be fascinating to see how many of these narratives get out there and how people feel about that. And then in the lurking backdrop, Jaden Daniels has got a lot of heat right now. Like Jaden Daniels is picking up momentum. And I'm curious to see whether some people go, well, maybe it's not either of these guys by the end of it. Maybe Jaden Daniels interviews fantastically maybe he blows it out in workouts and everybody goes hey yeah he had that one year at lsu but that represents who he is and where he's going and maybe this is actually the guy that nobody sees coming i also i like what you started with about um just being able to make plays off script versus within structure because i think that's what a lot of people missed on cj stroud and i can't remember if it was on this podcast that we were talking about it but just this idea of like oh bryce young could create which is great and is important but you shouldn't knock a guy for being able to get through his reads and being able to physically do what he needs to do to play within structure because that is not a bad thing that's actually a great thing and i think we're, we're seeing with a few offenses across the league how impactful that can be when they can do this the starting point so why while it might be more fun to watch when they're like just going crazy, it's also like a little bit less reliable. And I think that ability to play within structure, I think that will be one of the influences that the first year success of CJ Stroud relative to Bryce Young has on this year's draft analysis. But I also think CJ did a great job last year, stepping up to the podium when he was asked about that and saying, so we spent hundreds of hours practicing this play and you want me to go off script instead? I think the way he handled that was a brilliant part of it. And, you know, it's interesting because I'll go back to talking to Mike Tannenbaum a couple of weeks ago and asking him, you know, the evaluation, character evaluation. And one thing he said that's really stuck in my head is I'm reaching out to the backup safeties family to find out how this quarterback treated that guy. And like the layers that go into this, I think we don't 
don't necessarily think about C-Rob, and it makes a, a huge difference in relatability, because I, I do think that there is some character conversation that is fair and warranted when it comes to the work and what it takes and how you make it work and all of the little things that, that are part of this, because the NFL expectations on the work le level is so much higher than the college, right? So like how a guy is living matters a little bit when you're trying to figure out how it's going to translate to the next level to me. Yeah. And I mean, I will say this. It's not like that's just the conversation about Caleb Williams. I actually, there is a broader NIL conversation that's being had across the NFL in terms of like, is this going to change the mindset of some of these guys coming in? Like, are they going to be different because they've made this money and how will that, you know, some people change, you know, it, it does influence their decision-making it, you know? And so you're going to have millionaires who are coming in. I don't think anybody's against it. I just think they're saying, how is that going to affect the mindset of this guy when he comes in and we have to ask him to play special teams? And he's and he's like, I don't know if I want to play special teams, man. Like I'm a star and I've made all this money in NIL. And it's uh, so, yeah, it's not it's not where he lives and what he drives and who's around him. That's going to become part of this conversation, whether it's fair or not. And and I think there's plenty of argument that it's not, too. Um, but. What, I think there's me, a there's a fine line though, right? See, there right? Like, there's a line, like, like, because sure. I think there's a line in how is he going to adjust to a different life versus hey, this is like because I'm I'm with everybody, and I think we're trying to say it gently, but let's just be real that some of these conversations get particularly racially driven, they get really uncomfortable, and it feels like guys are judged the wrong way. I thought that happened to C.J. Stroud a lot. I thought it was stupid at the time. I'd say it again; it was stupid. Now I think there's a line between like I'm not here to. I don't care if Caleb Williams paints his fingernails. What I got to figure out is when Caleb Williams becomes a pro, how is he going to relate to this locker room, and how are guys going to respond to him, and how is he going to respond to the difference? In, like that's the line in trying to figure out sort of personalities and how they fit in, just in my opinion yeah and that's fair and i i think as you said there's a line i think that's on the right side of the line you know how how is he going to interact with teammates people want to be in the size 12 and a half so everybody wants to be in the size 12 and a half remark how does that resonate they'll watch how uh caleb williams talks about his team in press conferences his teammates they'll they'll do the same thing with drake may and they'll say does he deflect praise or does he absorb it does he share it with his teammates or does he hog it for himself um they'll ask that about both of these guys and but to me really when it gets down to it the more the most concerning thing i think is this idea that he is he's going out there and he's trying to produce big plays and you, you can't do that and you can't play every down like that in the nfl like one one scout said to me he was said um I'm paraphrasing him, but he was like, there are times where I was watching film on him and I would look at the defense and you know what, what he should do after the snap. And then he's making nonsensical decisions. Like he's doing things where I'm like, that does not make sense to me why he did that. And I don't see things from the defense that would have caused him to make that decision. You know, it wasn't like a disguised coverage. It wasn't like, Oh, um, it was uh, it was it was a zero blitz, but no, they actually rolled a safety back at the last minute or whatever. He was like, I was literally seeing things. I could not figure out why he did it. Like, why would he have done that? He's going the wrong way or he's doing this or he's doing that. And he he, he just said at times it felt like there was a lot of out of rhythm that he was seeing on on tape. And that that to me is probably concerning when you're really getting down to it and you you're setting everything off the field aside you're saying okay well let's just look at the football i loved watching johnny manzel in 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 college i love i mean he was amazing it was it was unbelievable watching him play but i do remember a big concern going into that draft was like i don't know how much of this translates that he's doing because he's doing a lot of stuff that's just wild major big playmaking he's hunting for these massive backbreaking plays and that's never going to work in the NFL. He's going to get killed. And it's just not an offense that is dependable because you have too many other players on the field that are going, I don't know what we're doing here. He's like running around trying to make a play. What the hell am I supposed to do? Everything can't be a chaos drill. I think the last of what you said there, too, is really important. We live in a world where everybody wants quarterbacks that can make plays off schedule. We have to remember that it's the job is to essentially execute the offense and when it falls apart, be able to make right. a playoff yes. schedule. Yes. It's, it's, it's such right. a difference.
And it, it is funny when you get this game manager title, because a lot of times that means the quarterbacks are actually doing their jobs as they are coached to do their jobs. And as the game intends and, and Aaron Rodgers is talking about uh, the way that Dak Prescott is playing quarterback right now on the Pat McAfee show last week. And, and Rogers said what he really likes about watching Dak right now. And Dak's one of his favorite quarterbacks to watch is that he's playing the position. He's not just throwing and he's using his cadence to try and get guys off sides. And he's looking for, he didn't say this, but this is something I know he's, he's looking at guys and potential defense. DPI opportunities and targeting those receivers. And there's so much mental games beyond just diet, not only beyond just throwing, but also beyond just diagnosing coverages and how he's trying to go on the offensive and actively use these different ways to play within the structure. And all of that are things that are things he's actively doing are things that are in increasing the Cowboys chances of winning, increasing the Cowboys chances of succeeding on each play, but they're within the structure and they might lead to this like super quick pass out of the pocket, but, but it's because of some of that pre-snap stuff that's going on. And so I think that when we analyze quarterbacks at this level and the ones coming in, understanding how they can do that should be at least as important as understanding what they can do when the play breaks down. Oh, so like, I will say this beacon of light, right? Of what you're saying, C Rob, when you talk about Jaden Daniels, who I, I got to talk to, check it out on Yahoo Sports. Really good interview, uh, really put together kid, right? Uh, so, Jaden Daniels, you talk about Caleb, you talk about Drake May. It feels more and more like there are at least three guys in this draft that are going to be worth, hey, I'm moving up, I'm taking that guy, I'm going to save my franchise. And if you look right now at who's picking in the top 10, there's a bunch of teams that need quarterbacks. So, I think this could be a really interesting draft for a lot of people. Now, uh, two teams that don't need quarterbacks, Cowboys, Eagles. It's the game of the week. There is big breaking news today. Mike McCarthy with acute appendicitis uh, having a procedure done. So the first thing is that he anticipates being available for the game. Uh, apparently has put structure in place for these sorts of you laugh, see, Rob. But uh, what are your thoughts? I, I just when I was when I was reading the release from the Cowboys uh, and, you know, it's like he's he's going to. He anticipates, you know, coaching. <laughs> I'm like, man, <laughs> I instantly I thought, well, that means he's out, right? Like he's not going to be out there, I guess, stitched up, you know, yelling and screaming and and moving around. And that this seems, I don't know, it doesn't seem like the wisest way to heal up from Wednesday to, I mean, Jesus, Wednesday he's getting this. It's not like it's Monday. Uh, yeah, that's uh it's coaches are just different, man. I swear to God. Yeah. I think it's interesting because first of all, uh, one of the, I guess, blessings of all of my medical journey is that I'm a little bit aware of how appendicitis surgery works. I had my gallbladder removed in 2009 and they told me at the time, they're like, we're going to make four holes, go in and get the gallbladder. Maybe stone's going to be like, can we cut this segment? Um, and they're like, your appendix moves around. So if we see your appendix and we can grab it without needing another incision, we'll grab it while we're there. <laughs> okay. And I'm like, okay, let me know. When it I moves wake around. Up. Like what? Like, is it, like, is it running from them? It's like, like Right, they're like, I don't think it like goes to your ankle, but I think it does move around your organs, like it kind of flows. Well, but the, but wait, all wait, of that wait, is wait, to wait, say, wait, wait, before you move on, like, in does that is that real? Like, do they really go? And by the way, while we're in there, if we see this, well, we're, we're just gonna go ahead and grab that. You don't need your appendix, <laughs> so like, if it can maybe cause problems later, then it's good to get it out. But if it's going to require another incision, like, what's the cost benefit analysis? Yeah. I'm, <laughs> just, I'm just imagining your appendix playing like basically dodgeball. It's like, nope, nope, <laughs> nope, nope. <laughs> you get that. Okay, go ahead. Please. Literally, I was like, I guess just let me know later. Like, I'll be here. Right. But next, <laughs> next time, next time I go into surgery, I'm gonna be like, yeah, go ahead, look around in there while you're in there. If you see anything, <laughs> you, see, you know, yeah, yeah you there's can something grab it. concerning. Go ahead and grab it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still have my appendix, so it, it's here for this podcast. It is present, as far as I'm aware. But um, if they can do it laparoscopically and just make and just make the holes and not have to like cut them open, it's not crazy for him to be on the sideline Sunday. I think the question is. I think he can like cognitively call plays just fine all those days later. I wouldn't necessarily do that on Thursday and even Friday is probably pushing it, especially if you're on pain meds, et cetera. But Sunday night is the end of the day. I think the bigger thing is like the Cowboys had another coach on staff who had to be in the booth last year because of medical issues. And one of the biggest concerns was him getting hit. If, if a play ran into and even during practice, this coach was not allowed to be on the field for practice, which was really hard for him because he was like, I like to be out there with my guys I like to have my hand on them. So what I'm curious is what are the Cowboys going to do to make sure that Mike McCarthy's incisions will, which will not, even if it's laparoscopic and it's just the holes, they'll not 
have closed up by Sunday, how to make sure that those don't get hit because that can lead to some pretty significant complications. Fitz looks so concerned right now about everything we're discussing. The holes haven't closed. I mean, I'm just, this is, oh. <laughs> and so I, I think you, I think you either one, do you send him in the booth? And if he's in the booth, is shoddy then calling the plays and Mike is radioing them in. I think in theory, Mike can still be on the headset from the booth. So he's He could still do that. It's just not what he would prefer. And then I, I think the last thing would just be like, is there some sort of setup on the sideline where he's not like pacing the sideline that he's cordoned off in some way to decrease the chance of him getting hit, but allow him to still have the view of the, the <laughs> he wants. He's going to be coaching from the Pope mobile. <laughs> okay, you that, is that the Monday night football thing? Because that is a hundred percent what I was like. What yeah, the, 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 put was him on, on the crane. Year? That's yeah, exactly the, what I was picturing here. And then put you, him on you a crane with a megaphone. Plays, but then you lower him down when Dak comes off the field so that they could talk, and then you raise him back up to make sure he doesn't get hit. This isn't funny because he's in pain right now. But the the opportunities are definitely intriguing. I mean, by the way, we did just see something in the Lions Saints game that was pretty gruesome. When somebody gets hit on the sidelines, you know, you saw that official with the broken leg. That was awful. So, you know, if there was ever an example that people on the sidelines can get drilled, Joy, um, Joy thinks that broken leg was really funny, by the way. <laughs> that's not the funny part. I'm just picturing, like, you also have to keep in mind who's going to be on the other sideline. Like, what if Big Dom comes after him? <laughs> <laughs> We can we cannot assume that people on the sidelines don't get involved when the Eagles are here. Like, I'm sorry, this is a pretty recent sample size we're working on. But hey, we just saw the Mike McDaniel clip where he was talking about player flipping over and the cleat like hit him in the shoulder, right? Like, I, I'm in, I'm in for the crane with the megaphone and he could just yell. Or like, I don't know if you've seen those like like those like big inflatable balls that people get in and then they run after each other and they hit each other and they bounce off of them. Maybe you put McCarthy like in a big inflatable ball and then all of a sudden if somebody hits him, yeah, 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 like you just put him in a ball and, and he rolls, but he then he's still wearing pads to protect the area. Like what you would do for a guy who has like broken ribs, but is playing in a game, which is crazy that that happens, but it does. Didn't Justin Herbert do that last year? I'll, I'll toot y'all's horn for a second uh, because you guys have been big on Dan Quinn for a minute and, and his future opportunities. Let's not pretend that this is a staff that is uh, void of someone that can right, step in and right. handle this for a game. Like Quinn is that's the easy point. answer, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I don't have concerns about that. I think first, Dan Quinn actually did serve as the head coach of a Cowboys game against the Saints. I want to say it was in 2021 when Mike McCarthy had COVID and wasn't able to be there. They won the game. Um, that was a Thursday night game, too. So like short week of practice. But he was the coach uh, The Cowboys scheduled for Dan Quinn to talk to the media on Wednesday when this news broke and for Brian Schottenheimer to address the media on Thursday. And for the, those two and John Fossil, who, by the way, has also been an interim head coach for the Rams to to co-lead practice. So I really don't have any concerns having been around all of those coaches in the organization that the preparation will be any different for this. And I also think that even when you think about the game plan, like NFL teams have their game plans. And before Wednesday, they might finish installing them and they might be working on like red zone in two minute tomorrow on Thursday. But this is not something where like Mike McCarthy is not going to have his fingerprints all over the game plan and the way he wants to call plays. Now, will he want to meet with Dak on Friday as they typically would to go over which calls he liked best on the call sheet? Maybe. But I think that again, they have that degree of communication. This is also not a first year head coach. This is a guy who's been in the building for, is this his fourth year? How is that? case well so that they know what they're doing like i don't expect this to impact the outcome of the game i'm actually curious though if it impacted the vegas betting lines it shouldn't but i wonder if it did oh that's a good question i didn't even think about that i don't know check. i don't know i will ask this question because you two are so tied into everything we've mentioned his name a couple of times i'm just sitting there I'm watching the broadcast and all of a sudden last week for the eagles dom gets involved now dom is a sensation everybody knows who he is but at the time you just hear the announcers repeatedly say, Tom, they said his name and they said he was part of security, but they couldn't tell you exactly what he did, exactly why he was out. Like to see Rob's point, this felt very Sopranos. Like there's no two ways. And I actually had a buddy text me and say, hey, uh, from the Eagles players, he's sort of the fixer. I did the whole world. Did y'all know who Dom was? Like see Rob, did you, did you, were you looking over there? You'd be like, oh, I know that's Dom. Like, oh, is, yeah, is this a know. known thing? Yeah. Yeah. People know who he is in the organization. Every, and by the way, every NFL team has one. They have, everybody has a dom. Everybody has a fixer. They have somebody that, you know, they have these, they call them heads of security, but they do a lot of different, a lot of different things. Sometimes guys are in trouble. Sometimes there's some issue that needs to be taken care of. And I don't mean like 
Joe Pesci walking into an empty room taken care of, but uh, <laughs> another reference that Joey's not going to get. So. No, but uh, I have been, I've been in a bar in Lower Broadway. I, I've been in a bar in Lower Broadway many years ago in Nashville with a bunch of Titans players when things started to get a little out of hand and some big dude walked in and he's like, everybody out! And they all left and it just, yeah, so like I get everybody, but like I, first name basis with him, like I didn't know that Dom was that pre prevalent. Oh, it's not just, it's not just his first name, it's nickname basis. Everyone was calling him Big Dom. Which is accurate, by the way. It's accurate. No, I was when when that it's, whole thing. Yeah, that name is more accurate than the picture on the Eagles website. That is definitely not from the last ten years. Well, when when Greenlaw and him got into it, I'm like, I wouldn't want to get into it, if, you know, with Greenlaw. And then I was kind of like, ah, it kind of looks like this is a pretty decent match. Like I don't, this is I could actually probably hold his own right now with him. Should the league do anything about this, or is this just one of those things they let go away? It's not great, right? But he talked to John Lynch after the game. Uh, the the GM for the 49ers. I think everybody's good squashing it. You know, they're they're I don't know what the league will say or do, but at the very least, you just say, hey, can't have that happen again, right? Don't be putting your hands on players. Um <laughs> maybe your role on the sidelines needs to be back a few feet. Uh he's a hero there though. Good God. Oh yeah, no, I was at that game, as y'all know. And in Philly, I'm like just listening in the press box. They probably cut to commercial at this point. And Dom is getting escorted off. Everyone is giving him a standing ovation. The Philly fans were loving it. And then as soon as he leaves, they turn their attention back to the refs and they just start booing the refs incessantly. They made very clear who they were cheering for and who they were booing for. But I mean, what I would say is that the NFL policies are so often based at least as much, if not more, I would probably argue more on perception than reality. And so like, for example, if in the NFC championship game, the, the 49ers backup quarterback had come in and won the game or somehow Josh Johnson, something had happened. Christian McCaffrey had had something heroic happen. I don't think we would have the emergency quarterback role that we had. We had it because of the impact it had. Had the 49ers lost this game, had they been gashed by Jalen Hurts and not had a linebacker like Dre Greenlaw to, to ward him off, then it might lead to a real change. But because the 49ers not only won, but they won decisively and they clearly like were able to do it without Greenlaw, even though Greenlaw is a good player it's not going to be like a topic of conversation in my opinion it, i do question the idea of tossing someone who's in team personnel and then that the the balance of it being a player right like oh, yeah. I, it was not I, like, a to fair me, yeah I'm, I'm like you affect the the game on the field at that point and we've seen that happen before when it was i feel it was chiefs browns like a couple years ago where it was like a coach and a player kind of got into it and I don't remember if someone got tossed or not. I felt like they both got tossed, but um, I don't know. I feel like officials wise, maybe you don't toss either in that situation. You just assess penalties and you go because it's a player and someone who's not on the field playing. We can't create this imbalance by tossing a guy that like, you know, if it's Fred Warner or Greenlaw or who, you know, who the hell knows. Um, and, and another thing, too. What if it had been a quarterback? Do you think there would have been a different mm, yeah. assessment yes. at that point? Does Brock Purdy get tossed if Brock Purdy's on the sidelines and he gets into a shoving match with some personnel person? I bet you they don't toss Brock Purdy. I think that you make a great point because I think what they should do in that situation is two things. One, warn them and say, if either of you make contact with anyone again, who you shouldn't be making contact with, then you'll be ejected because then there's a warning and then you have some sort of deterrent because you need a deterrent since the tempers had already flared as much as they did. And then you find them both afterwards. I just think that to, to both of y'all's points, it creates dangerous precedent at some point, because frankly, now all I'd be rooting for, like when the Raiders play the charge or the chiefs, I really hope the Raiders fixer goes out there and pisses off Travis Kelsey. Yeah, let's go. I'll lose the fixer on the sideline all day. If it costs a star player from the other side, like, Hey, let, let's get that. The next time Max Crosby and Patrick Mahomes are John, boy, I hope the fixer gets right up there in Mahomes' face. Like I think that's the dangerous precedent that is set. But I think C Rob's right. If it had been Mahomes, a, he wouldn't have been ejected and B, the rule would have already been changed and the guy would never be allowed on the sideline again. Like, uh, we are all people that have been credentialed on the sidelines. It is easy to get those credentials taken away. The league certainly would not mince words for most. Like, if it had been me just getting up in Greenlaw's face, A, I'd probably be dead. But B, I'd never be allowed on the sideline again. I realize why Dom is in a different category. I'm just saying that the league, league needs to be a little careful, in my opinion, because it does uh, set up a – a bit of a situ situation. So speaking of situations, C-Rob, you've been digging into the Dak Prescott contract situation. And 
This is interesting because Dak is playing at an MVP caliber level, right? We all know that. He's, it's, it's part of the conversation this year. It's been this huge ascension for him. He looks absolutely delightful. But that raises some issues because the Cowboys are in that spot that teams want to be in. You got to pay a lot of players. So what's the situation look like to you? Well, I mean, if he plays at this level, um, when you talk to agents who deal with quarterback contracts, who – you know, have been in these rooms and drawn this up and and negotiated. He's got an insane amount of leverage because they have to clear, uh, they have to shrink his cap number next off season to be able to operate, sign other deals. Um, so the pressure is really there uh, to get an extension done. And it's interesting to me because when I talked to somebody in in Prescott's camp last, uh, like the off season coming in, and there was this idea that like, hey, maybe they might extend Dak now, and they were just like. Ah, nah, we're good. Like it's gonna get done. There's no problem. There's no problem. It was really clear that they were reclined. They're like, we're we're totally fine going into this season and getting it done. And I think uh, next off season, the 2024 in in 2024. And I think it's because they knew the massive amount of leverage Dak would have at that point. He, he, there's a no trade clause. There's a, a a no tag clause, and they gotta lower his his number next off season. He's gonna hold all the cards, and now he's playing at an MVP level. So to these agents, what they see is that's going to be the highest paid player in the NFL when he does, unless he dictates that he does not want that, unless he says, I'm going to do the Aaron Rodgers thing and I'm going to give money back, you know, or take money away from myself so that you can spread it around. He's going to be the highest paid player in the NFL when, when he does that extension. So you're talking 55 million APY plus, I would guess it's probably going to be another four year deal. And He'll probably set a new record in in guaranteed money in a contract. Well, short of the obviously the Deshaun Watson uh, contract, where that and I'm I'd love Jory to weigh in on this is you're also going to have Ceedee Lamb who right now is projecting to be a player who will be in that 25 million plus APY category at wide receiver. You also have Micah Parsons who's going to have a very good argument that he should be the highest paid defensive player in football when he comes to the table. It's really hard for teams to operate with the gargantuan uh, quarterback contract. We have not seen one do it with the quarterback, with the wide receiver, and then also with uh, the highest paid defensive player. So, you you know, essentially you're going to have the highest paid offensive and highest paid defensive player in the game potentially at some point for the Dallas Cowboys. But depending on where the cap goes, you could see three guys eating up 40% of your your salary cap APY when you flatten it out and you look at over the length of the deals, it's pretty wild. Yeah, I'd encourage all of you to go check out C. Rob's piece on this on the site, but you make great points. First of all, the Cowboys need to do something with Dak's contract because right now his cap hit is $59.5 million for the 2024 season, and that's just not feasible. And so you say, okay, what do you want to do with that? How do you factor in, like you said, C.D. and Micah Parsons? And that's where I agree that Dak both has the leverage and also could use that leverage in a number of ways. By no means do I think that he should give them a hometown discount if he doesn't want to because he deserves everything he's getting, and I also think that he has this opportunity in the next stretch to show like okay he has played he's played extremely well ever since that Niners game he's played it really well against some teams including Eagles Chargers Rams but also against some teams that like don't have as strong defenses now he's about to have the chance to prove himself against the Eagles Bills Dolphins and Lions all in a row which is like a stacked lineup and so I think that while we in the media will often look at that APY how much is he making per year? I think what Dak has the opportunity to do is say, how do I want to structure this? Do I want to make it so that I can kind of be in concert with what CD and Micah are doing so that even though I'm making the money I want, I'm having it hit in different years than they are because I know how much he values this, like, both of them and in different ways, his ability to work with CD on the field and his ability to have Micah close out the games that he, he wants. And also how much longer does he want to play for? What kind of flexibility does he want? The last time that they did these negotiations, Dak Prescott, his representation, and Todd France and, and sort of their whole team who was working on this deal were absolutely like dead set on we are not doing these five plus year deals that the Cowboys want. The Cowboys like to have the cap flexibility to push money down the road to restructure guys constantly. And Dak's like, no, I'm we're doing a four year deal. We're going to have this ability to get back to the table when he's 30. He'll be turning 31 next July now. But when his deal is starting to enter its final year and as you Rob puts really clearly in his column, no franchise tag, no tag, no trade. And so they can't just say like, oh, this is a next year problem. No, this is very much a this year problem and a problem that they have to encounter now if they want to sign the other guys, which they do. And so I think that 
if I'm the Cowboys, I need to be getting creative, not just on how I'm spending my money, but when I'm spending my money and how all of that works in concert. Uh, one thing, too, I'll bring up real quick for, for people who sit there and go, well, why doesn't he give the discount or whatever? First off, Joe Burrow didn't. Remember, they were talking about, will you do the Mahomes deal? And I was just going to say, the Joe Burrow one is so funny because he might have showed us a blueprint on how to handle this, in which all along he said, I care about the team. I want my guys here. And so by the time the money actually hit after the Justin Herbert, no one was thinking about the fact of like, why didn't he give the discount? It just made him look like a really good guy all along because of that rhetoric. He wasn't, and, and it was fascinating because he didn't do it. And he I just noticed. talked like this. <laughs> I noticed. But don't you think that the public perception at large was that like he wanted his guys there and then Justin Herbert, who has done less both statistically and certainly in the postseason than Joe Burrow had the deal. And it's like, well, OK, well, then he deserves it. So like that is honestly like a really interesting PR tactic that probably more guys could use. And, and again, you have the whole idea of like, is Joe Burrow then not reflecting like are other guys at the position not going to be thrilled with you if you're like, I don't need everything. I'll be fine but he took everything anyway continue yeah. i just feel strongly no, I, about that <laughs> yeah I, I i definitely noticed because when i as soon as i saw the numbers i was like wait a minute this is not the keep the band together contract this is the i maxed it out contract and you know probably what fans don't understand anytime a player that is in that position to max it out shows any hint of reservation like sort of like man i don't know if i want the guys in the locker room looking at me like i took every dollar i could Typically, there's an agent going, shut up, <laughs> sign the deal like you're going to take the money. And and in in Dak's case, two things I would point out. Um, number one, he didn't take a discount the last time either. He maxed out. I mean, that that 40 was like at that point, that to me was the ceiling when he got the 40 million, the four year uh, 40 million APY. And he played three years of very high level football on a fourth round pick contract. He he like they were stealing money from him for three years. It wasn't like, oh, well, we developed Dak into this player or whatever. No, he came out of the box as a rookie and played at a really high level. You had success. And yet he played on a pretty cheap contract for three years. So there's now he's just making it all back on the back end. I just I just don't know how the Cowboys, as you said, they're going to have to get creative. The accountants, the cap people, I would say the personnel people who are going to have to draft a lot of really good talents who are cheap. You know, there's all those people are going to have to work in concert to to make this uh, all come together because more it's... Duran Blands for everybody. Even though he yeah, had a exactly. bit of a game yeah. I think that the personnel part of this is important because they got to draft well, right? Like that's the if you look at the numbers and I had the numbers run a couple of years ago. If you look at the numbers at quarterbacks that count more than 10 percent of the salary cap, there's no empirical data that you can't win a Super Bowl. It's about a 50 50 split on quarterbacks that are 10, more than 10 under 10. But the, the thing of it here that makes this different is the other two players that are going to have to get huge money. It means the Cowboys are going to have to draft a another CD lamb and another Micah Parsons. And like, that's just easier said that like, you can't let your quarterback walk that that is not an option. You can't just replace Dak. So you're going to have to figure out a way to sign these guys. And then that means every second, third, fourth round pick, they're all going to have to be home runs for a long time. And then you're going to have to let some of them walk too, because some of those players, you know, are going to turn into good players and they're going to command a certain element of money. And you're going to have to go, no, we're just going to take the, compensatory pick because we got to let some of this talent walk, even though we would like to keep it a la T Higgins with the Cincinnati Bengals. They'd love to keep him. They know they're not going to be able to afford it. They're going to have to let him walk and take the compensatory. I also want to clarify that while Dak will have the ability to make his MVP case over these next couple games with all the really strong competitors and, and he'll have an ability to influence the narrative. I actually don't know how much the next four or five weeks are going to influence the way that they look at his contract now postseason probably but i think it's worth remembering when he got that four-year 160 million dollar contract he was coming off a week five compact compound fracture and dislocation of his ankle this guy couldn't even walk he was actually i should say he showed us at his press conference where he was getting his contract that he could sort of like hop a few steps that was like his whole thing but he got that money when he couldn't walk and he hadn't done what he's doing this year and so i think that for the cowboys it's do they want want him or not and you could say if he can't do it in the playoffs maybe they'll decide well then that's something that factors in and Jerry gets emotional about that but if they want him they're going then he has the ability to command that price pretty much regardless of what happens 
in December, um, but it will definitely influence how, how much of a firestorm it is on social media and on the talk shows. Let's just keep that conversation smart as we always try to do on this show, because the last time he got a contract, everybody was yelling, well, the Cowboys don't want him. That's why it's taking so long. It's like, no, they wanted him for more years. Like that, that, it wasn't that they didn't want him. They wanted a longer commitment. So like, as long as we stay nuanced in that, uh, speaking of nuance before we get out of here, uh, obviously looking at this game, there's one big difference. Shaq Leonard added to the Eagles. Le- they need some linebacker help. But Jory, I know you're writing on this right now. We got two teams in the Cowboys and Eagles that got to be looking over at San Francisco right now saying, holy hell, the 49ers look absolutely unbeatable. Uh, are, are the 49ers at this point just that much better than the team? Because they're the ones blowing out the good teams. Are they in a league of their own? Yeah, I mean, you got to note that, first of all, with the Shaq Leonard signing, the Eagles are coming off a game in which they allowed eight yards per carry. Eight. Eight yards per carry. That's really bad. Six isn't great. Eight is really bad. Six, um, isn't, six <laughs> isn't great? Really? That's like, six, six is awful. Right. That's, that's <laughs> god awful. Well, I was thinking that, but they actually had already allowed 6.8 to Washington, and they had several fives. Yeah, six is bad. Eight is really bad. And again, all of those like 46 and 48-yard Debo Samuel situations skewed this, but it's really, really bad. They missed a lot of tackles. I think to me, as interesting as the question of how much better the 49ers are than the Eagles is, did the 49ers just expose a blueprint to beat the Eagles? Eagles. I do think that the blueprint they expose is not going to work with every personnel group because it's much easier to say you want to contain Jalen Hurts than to actually do it. And the 49ers have the defensive line to do it. But what I loved is I wrote about this this week is that the 49ers came into this game plan and they came into this game. They're averaging five sacks a week over the last three weeks since they traded for Chase Young at the deadline. And you're thinking like, oh, pass rush sacks. Like that's how they're going to get him. Like he won't be able to throw the ball. And instead, San Francisco was like, eh, if he throws, but we stop the running game, we're good. And the Eagles just rushed for 46 yards, which was their fewest in almost five years. It was like four days short of five years um, since they had had that few rushing yards. And so I think it's really fascinating. Like we've heard different trap, like people perceive it as trash talk when guys have said over the years, like with the Giants, for example, when they had Saquon Barkley, like if we just make them win through the air, then, then we feel good about our game plan going against them. But that's really what the 49ers did. And so I think you have to ask, are other teams going to be able to successfully do that? And if so how are the Eagles going to respond? And it's not because it's not a Jalen thing. Like Jalen statistically did not have a bad game, but when Jalen doesn't get moving, doesn't create plays as much and doesn't use his legs as a threat, the rest of the runners aren't as much of a threat because Jalen hasn't already been a threat. And then you just like kind of make the Eagles one dimensional. And I think that that's something that Philly has to be concerned about. Yeah. I think that's been the book, you know, for, for a while when you would talk to teams about playing the Eagles, they're like, yeah, force them to beat you from the pocket. Don't, be the team that you look at the stat sheet at the end of the game and you've given up 200 rushing yards to Philly. You're going to lose that game 99 times out of a hundred when they're, you know, ripping off these massive, uh, you know, running games. And that that always means hurts has been a big part of, of the run game. I'm curious to see what Shaq Leonard adds. I'm very curious because I, you know, again, I don't know that he's the Shaq Leonard that we all thought maybe he still is. Maybe he isn't. They needed a linebacker. He's definitely a name. I want to see what he actually produces when when he gets out out on the field in that um, in that scheme and whether he is the high level player uh, that he had been historically up until the injuries kicked in. He's certainly going to have some help on the defensive line in front of him. That's going to swallow true. up a lot, right? Yeah, like that's that. true. For sure. But I, I think you make a fair but point. But not enough that, to keep them from rushing for eight yards per carry. That, <laughs> That I think that's the most uh, that just speaks to the fact that San Francisco is not only wildly talented, they're just really well coached. Like I, I don't want to oversimplify y'all, but like you just look at San Francisco, it's like okay, top to bottom, they draft well, they're really well coached. Their GM knows what he's doing. They're aggressive at the right times at the trade deadline, and by the way, they're they're, they're wildly good. Like it just. I know it hasn't resulted in Super Bowls, but my God, you just watch them every single week. It's just. Chef's kiss. I, I'm jealous. As a fan of an organization that doesn't have any of those things put together, I am jealous every time I watch the 49ers. All right. Uh, I'm back tomorrow with Zero Blitz. Obviously going to have a little fun there. You can follow us on social media at Jason Fitz for me, at Charles Robinson for him, at Jory Epstein for her. Stone doing God's work at SJ Rochelle is our producer behind the glass. See, Rob, as always, tell everybody how they can continue to support Therese Paler's legacy. Yeah, if you could, please check out BreakingTea.com slash Therese. For the all juice tees and hoodies, remember that proceeds uh, from that purchase go to support the Therese Paler Scholarship at Howard University. 
And once again, that's breakingtea.com slash Therese. And you can also contribute directly to that uh, scholarship as well as the one in his name at Missouri if you check out our podcast description. You guys can leave us that five-star review. We genuinely appreciate that. Also, rate, subscribe, tell your friends, family, and enemies, everybody to hang out with us every single week. We will be back next Wednesday with more Inside Coverage. Have a great week, y'all.